morning, everybody. It's great to be here in this uh, beautiful venue and uh, the Green Summit. So uh, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, uh, re really great to share some thoughts uh, about world views. So really, how we think about the world shapes behaviors. We heard just before about how, how do we collectively work? How do we collectively work together on the transition? And it's our, our world views that often shape that behavior. I grew up, it was the Cold War in Europe. This is a picture of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall separated east from west. If you lived in the west, you couldn't go east and vice versa. So it literally was a, a, a wall down the middle of the city. And it didn't really mean much to me, but it just shaped my worldview. I thought that was how Europe was. If you went traveling in Europe, you went north-south. You couldn't go east-west. It was just impossible. So everybody of my generation just thought that was what you did. And what was really interesting is the Berlin Wall was only there for 28 years. So it shaped a whole generation's view about what Europe was, what was possible, how we should live, etc. It was just how it was. And, um, so what we need now is a worldview for the next 28 years. So the next 28 years take us to mid-century. So we need a worldview that says this is how we should think about the transition. We're in the transition era. On the left, you see where commitments were to net zero at the beginning of just of this decade, 30%. So the red tells you where there was sort of you know, no statement at all. Um, and on the right, you can see, so we're now over 90%. So in terms of commitment, we really are in the net zero era. Over 90% are covered by some form of a government commitment or legislation or at least under discussion. So what does that um, worldview, should it entail? So first off, it needs mass decarbonization. So these charts show you the dotted line is what our economic modeling shows. If you just choose the cheapest technology, where do you get to? But the colors are really where you need to get to if, if you want to reach net, net zero. So, and if you look on the right is a list of all of the industries that need to be transformed in the next 30 years. So massive system change, decarbonization is sort of how we need to think about it. And I have uh, a few slides to summarize that. I have a lot of slides, so bear with me. Um, we'll move swiftly through them. But basically this chart shows you how do you get there? What kind of components will help you get there? And based on our modeling, about half of what we need is clean power. So half of um, the decarbonization will come from clean power. 23% will come from electrification. So that's things like electric vehicles, electric heat pumps, et cetera. And then there's another 5 to 10% between hydrogen, bioenergy, CCS. There's some recycling and some carbon removals. So it's sort of that combination of things that we need. And on the power side, whichever way you jump, you're going to need lots of renewables. So left or right, you know, economic or net zero, you'll need a lot of renewables. If you look on the right, though, you'll need renewables, plus you'll need some other renewables like hydro. Um, you'll need nuclear. You'll need CCS, so fossil fuels with CCS. That's what our modeling tells us is part of the solution. And two other things I'd point out. One is it's going to be different by sector. So that was the power sector. The starting point and the ending point will be different if it's industry or transport or building. So again, you can see uh, the different energy mixes start and end. And it's also going to be different by country. So these are eight different countries. If you look at France there, the red is nuclear. So it's a very much a nuclear nation. It'll ha still have a lot of nuclear by mid-century, but it will also have uh, some renewables. If you look at Australia on the top right, it's pretty sunny in Australia. Um, they are going to have a lot of solar alongside wind uh, and some fossil fuels with CCS. So again, by sector and by uh, geography, it'll be different, but essentially the components in the transition will be the same. So what are the three big drivers? One of those is going to be money. So we believe the energy transition is going to be a $200 trillion opportunity. And so if you look at the chart on the right, the supply side of that is green and gray and the demand side of that is in blue. So you can see about 50-50 supply side and demand side of our 200 trillion. And right now we're at 1.1. So sort of the good news is it went up 31%. So despite war in the Ukraine, uh, inflation, supply chain issues, et cetera, last year investment was up 31% in these clean technologies. 
And it's about 50-50. Um, the words haven't quite come out in the translation here, but these are all the different. So the yellow there is renewable power. The top half of that, the green, is that's electric vehicles. So that's investment going into supply and demand. And it's different by country. Again, the, the, the lines here are different countries. Let me tell you what the top is. The top is, we turn it into a quiz. The top is China. Um, so half of the 1.1 trillion is from China. The next block is uh, the US. So uh, you know, qu quite a big distance behind. Then you have you know, countries like Germany, et cetera. So again, in our transition, there's a lot more that could be invested um, by countries. And then the chart on the left here is our 1.1 trillion. So that's clean technologies. Next to it is how much is being spent on the grid. So there was 274 billion. Um, good job I remembered these numbers. 274 billion uh, spent on grid. There's also the next block is around supply chain and manufacturing. And then there's financing. So um, you know that those are the different ways that money can flow in. And what you'll see here is a comparison between uh, clean investment versus fossil fuel investment over the last few years. The left hand of this is 2018. So in 2018, we were investing half as much in clean as we were in fossil. You can see how the green uh, bars have risen. We're now 50-50. So we're essentially investing 1.1 trillion in both. So that's, um, that's progress. But what this chart shows you is um, the uh, grid plus the 1.1 on the left. The first bar is what we need to be spending this decade. So in, in this decade, we need to treble what we're spending uh, on clean energy infrastructure. It get, goes up to about over 6 trillion for the next decade. And for the third decade, we're over 7 trillion. So those are the kinds of numbers we need to think about. And one of the uh, ways to, to really shape that, we did a piece of work for GFANS. Um, so that's the uh, Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. We looked at all of these scenarios from these different uh, players in the market. And what we did is we looked at the investment spend for uh, each one of these decades. So each color is a scenario. Each block is a decade. Um, so if you then take an aggregate of that, it tells you how much you need to invest in clean versus fossil. And the ratio you need is a four to one ratio in this decade. So that's really where we need to, for every dollar we spend on fossil, we should be spending four on clean infrastructure. We can't move to a clean infrastructure that's not actually built out. And if you roll that clock forward for the next two or three decades, you go six to one, 10 to one. So by mid-century, it'll be $10 for every one in fossil. And you can split where we are now by geography. So on the right uh, is that ratio split by geography. And interesting enough, what you'll see, Europe now, it's $2.6 for every one, 2.6 clean for every one. And what I would say is that's because the worldview in Europe about transition has just been there longer. So for the last decade plus, people have said, hey, we just got to decarbonize. We may as well get on with it. And the investment has followed that. We're at about 0.6 to 0.8 for other geographies, and clearly much less uh, the Middle East and Africa. So, And um, these are actually banks. So uh, hopefully you can get the slides later. It's got all of the details filled in. But this is the top 10 banks who are investing over 10 billion. Um, for NatWest Group, it's 5.5. So for $5.5 for every one they invest in fossil for NatWest Group. They're an outlier at the top there. Um, and then it moves down to things like Deutsche Bank, et cetera. So the, or the, you know, the top 10 take you down to about $1.3 uh, clean to, to fossil fuel. So there's a long way to go. We need to get to four to one. But the idea of the ratio is whatever size your bank, you can look at that ratio and say, are we actually leaning in enough to the transition? So that's, um, that's finance. So then there's technology is another piece. So these are cost curves for how cheap uh, wind, solar, and lithium ion batteries are becoming. So I'm sure you've all seen these technology cost curves. These are now pretty mature technologies. And the good thing is, the more we build, the cheaper they get. 
So it's 29% is the learning rate for solar. So for every doubling in capacity, it gets 29% cheaper. So these are being rolled out, um, not just because they're clean, but because they're just the cheapest um, uh, you know, uh, energy source that you're going to see. And then there are a few things that make a bit less sense today. So there are sort of phase two type technologies. One of them is hydrogen, CCS is another. So these are where the economics really don't add up. What this chart shows you is green hydrogen is the, is the line coming down because electrolyzers are getting cheaper, renewable energy is getting cheaper, so you can see that coming down, versus uh, hydrogen made with fossil fuels, so with CCS, which is that blue line. And you can see in the 2030s, this really starts to make financial sense. But what we need to do now is invest in the R&D side of it. So then we'll end up with a world that either has some clean molecules. So on the left here, you'll see things like shipping and steel will be hydrogen or clean molecules, and then a whole bunch of things that are going to get electrified. So on the right, so you know, road, uh, transportation, aluminium, uh, you can electrify aluminium. So there'll be some kind of balance, again, different by sector, different by geography. Two other things to comment on. One is the, the, the costs are going to be very different by geography. So depending on how sunny and windy it is, literally will tell you how cheap this stuff gets. So on the left, the cheapest hydrogen in 2013 is going to be Brazil and Chile. The most expensive is going to be the other end of this chart, which is Japan and Korea. And that's a sort of almost like a three to one type ratio. So again, as people think about um, what to deploy, the economics will be different depending on where you are. And also, this is a supply demand chart. The bars are uh, supply for hydrogen. So this is planned hydrogen out. Um, but yeah, it, this takes you to about 2030. Um, the, the, bar, the penultimate bar takes you to 2030. And it's actually uh, 14 million tons that people want to produce. The demand line is 4.3 million tons. So right now, the supply planned is absolutely going to outstrip demand. But again, it's early stage, so now we need policies to up that demand so we can balance supply and demand. OK. The third thing is policy. I'm going to explain what this chart really means. And then honestly, you, you're going to have to uh, re read it later. So on the left is IRA. So basically, IRA, uh, 369 billion. We highlighted 260, which is across different technologies. So the good thing is it's very uh, comprehensive. On the uh, right-hand side is the infrastructure law. Also, the infrastructure law was very, very beneficial. So things like charging infrastructure are in the infrastructure law rather than IRA. So again, with system change, you need um, policies that are very broad. And already, so we've had to redo our forecast of how much wind and how much solar will get built because the IRA has changed the game. On the left, you'll see the solar um, installation. So, um, you know, that, that is, uh, you know, 10 gigawatts more by 2025. So already by 2025, you're really going to be seeing the impact that this policy has. On the right, again, you can see on the wind side, the real uptick by 2025. So policy is a driver that can really make a difference quite quickly. This is EV sales. Um, the uptick here takes us past 50%. So, so with uh, the IRA Act, we believe that you know, over 50% of cars sold on the road globally will be, uh, actually this is a US chart, will be over 50%. So again, you can see the uptick. On the right is the, the fleet size. And there has now been 52 billion um, already announced on uh, EV and battery manufacturing in the US just in the last six months. So that's pretty amazing. The last six months, 52 billion is, is now being committed that would not have been committed before. And you can see that's already building out a battery uh, supply chain across the US. So many, many states benefiting from that. And you, you know, the one other thing I would add on policy is these are countries. Uh, the top is China, then Canada, then the US top 15. And on the right is you'll see, so what are the six different uh, areas, five different areas in the supply chain? And we ranked countries basically, because every country is now sitting down and saying, okay, there's going to be no, so much need for batteries. 
what are we going to do in the battery space? Do we have metals and raw materials? Are we going to do manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so again, policy needs to align to the actual industrial strategy. This one came out, right? So my son actually talked about the Berlin Wall. There is no Berlin Wall. This is a monument to the Berlin Wall that is now in the middle of the city. And my son Tom moved there about two months ago to go work there. When he was born, there was no Berlin Wall. So the Berlin Wall came down in 89. He was born in the late 90s. So in his, his, for his generation, Berlin was just one large, cool city in Europe, part of a unified Germany. So in one generation, my mindset, my worldview is completely different to his. And actually, that's what we need to do with the energy transition. Up until now, we've not really had the mindset that we're all involved in the transition. And really, what we need to do is have that mindset. For the next 28 years, we're all in transition. What we need to do is join up. We're going to have massive uh, decarbonization, system change across all of those industries. We need to lean into the financing. Um, so our financing really needs to be weighted towards clean. The technologies are already there, but they're either we need to deploy them or we need to invest in R&D or proofs of concepts uh, to build them out. And finally, we need good policy. We need policymakers to play this game and have the same worldview as everybody else. And if we can do that, then I think we're in fairly good shape for net zero mid-century. Thank you very much.